Hey guys, I'm One Clue, and today do we want to take a look on the BitX, explicitly the BitX scammer, and how to set it up. So let's get started and right into it. It's 2025 and we are currently running the firmware version 2.8.1. So it is time to redo a setup guide for you guys so that you do know what you need to do if you do set up the BitX for the very first time. So to everybody who is joining new into this community of open source mining, welcome. I'm glad to introduce you to the BitX. The first thing that you will get is obviously this tiny device. It is handsome. It's a nice little single ASIC chip mini Bitcoin home miner, however you want to call it. Um, some people call it a solo miner, some other call it a lottery mining device. It is totally up to you how you want to call it. It is a nice little device. And the first thing that you need to make sure is if you do purchase a BitX from whatever merchant you do, make sure that you do have a power supply that is sufficient enough. This right here is a 5 volt 8 amps power supply. This is a little bit over spec, but I do other testings with that, so that's totally fine. What's also really important is that it does have this sort of barrel plug connector, because this goes right into the BX right here. And basically, the only thing that you need to do is to plug in the power cord into the barrel connector and then follow the steps that you will see on the screen. On top here is a little screen which you can use to view the stats of your mining session and so on. There are also other screens available, but one thing that is really important here is most of the manufacturers, they don't solder in these displays. These displays are really tiny and they are a little bit fragile. So the first thing that you actually want to do is make sure that it does fit snugly into the board. Also, this is no mistake. The board and the pinouts and the holes for the pins is designed in a way that it's called friction fit. So if your display is a little bit loose or your display does not work, it is recommended to snuggle a little bit around with it and press it a little bit into the pins again to make sure they do sit in there really tight. That's important. If you do have a soldering iron and you do know how to solder, feel free to solder in the pins for the display, then you will no longer have this issue. So the first thing that we actually want to do is now live plug in the bit eggs. And this should give us all the instructions that we actually do need. On the screen, you will now find the information, configuration Wi-Fi and connect to the BitX to set up it to your network. Below that, you will see Wi-Fi for setup and then the Wi-Fi name. So the next step that we actually want to do is we want to grab our phone, our notebook, or in my case, the tablet and connect to it. So what we want to do is we want to go into the Wi-Fi settings and in here we will quickly look up for the BitX connection. We do see here is the BitX underscore 1DB5. The naming scheme is totally on its own. It's tied to the MAC address of the chip on this board. So we click on that. What it should do, it should automatically open up a captive portal. You do see I'm running an Android display here. So in this case, it didn't do it. I don't know why, but that's not an issue. We just go into the home screen, we go into our browser, and the thing that we want to type in here is a IP address 192.168.4.1. This will also bring you to the configuration page of your BitX. It is explicitly set for this BitX, so if this captive portal is this automatically opening website is not opening. So this website here should open automatically, but if it is not doing, then you need to type in the IP address, but you need to be connected to the BitX. Now what you can do is totally simple. You just click on the glasses icon here to the right hand side, next to Wi-Fi SSID, and it's now searching for Wi-Fi networks nearby. I'll select my network, and then we go into the password section, and we just type in the password 
that we do have. We click on save and now basically you're done. The BIDX should now restart but what we can also do is we can click on restart manually. So we click on restart. Now the device is restarting. It's now picking up the Wi-Fi screen. And what we want to do now is we want to hop into the Wi-Fi settings again and we see I'm connected back again to my home network. One important thing that you will quickly find out here is on the screen of your BIDX, on the screen itself, it will show you the IP address that the device does have. And what you can do then is you can go over to the IP address. In my case, it is 10.0.10.186. If I do open this up, it will open up the web UI of the BIDX. And here's one important thing. The BIDX is usually set up with a Bitcoin address already in it. This is no issue or anything else. This is done by default in order to have something in there. What you want to do is you want to click on the burger menu on the left hand side and then you go over to pool settings. And in here what you want to do is you want to change this address, the first Bitcoin address, and the second Bitcoin address. It's a little bit confusing here. We will go over all of these steps in just a second. But these are basically the two steps that you need to do. You need to connect it to your Wi-Fi. And the second thing that you need to do is you need to change your Bitcoin address. So if your BitX does find a block, you will get the rewards. So now let's go back over to the dashboard again and let's take a look what we do see in here. We get a usual preview of the hash rate that we do have. We also get a little bit of a preview on the efficiency as well as the shares. Shares are basically the answers that the device that did send over to the pool in order to tell the pool, well, you gave me work to do and here's the answer for this work. If you scroll down, you do see the best difficulty. We have a all time best difficulty. This will be stored even if the device does reboot. And below that is since system boot, this is the best difficulty that you have achieved since your device booted up. Below that, you will find a nice hash rate and temperature graph for your device. And if you scroll down even further on the desktop, this might be looking a little bit different. Then you would find the power and the heat section. There you do get usual stats about the device and on the bottom is the pool that we are currently connected to as well as the uptime. The pool, it currently says primary pool, this does switch. If your first connection to the first pool ever comes to a stop or the pool goes down, it will automatically connect over to a secondary pool. In order to take a better look on it, how it would look like on your PC, we are now switching over to the PC and taking a look on it from this endpoint here. So we have taken a look on the dashboard, the main page of your BitX device. The next thing that we want to do is we want to go into Swarm. Swarm is a feature that you do have on your BitX in order to make sure that you can monitor all of the devices that you do have in your network. All of them need to be in the same network, otherwise it wouldn't be able to showcase them to you on this page. You do see I have currently eight devices up and running, about 7.2 terahash and roughly 153 watts that has been consumed by them. I also see the best difficulty of all devices in general, so the highest one will always be there. A cool feature here that you can do is you do see they are named and they are sorted by their IP address and they do have different colors depending on which kind of model you do have. Another cool thing is you do have a edit, a restart and a remo remove button. So if I would click on edit, it would open up a template. Uh, let's quickly do that for another device. Let's use this one here. If I do open this up here, I can now edit this device without the need to go over to this IP address of the other BitX, which is a really cool feature that I do like to have in here. So that's this one page. It's just a nice overview of your entire swarm of BitX devices that you do have. Fun fact, this also works with the NerdX series, so the NerdX Ultra, the NerdX Gamma, and all the other NerdQX variants that are out there. 
If you now go over to network, this was the page that you have seen previously when you set up the BIDX for the very first time. It is designed to be that, so it's really easy to guide you through the steps of setting up your BIDX and getting it up and running. If you go over to pool settings, this is the configuration page where you do set the pool that you want to use. You can change this to whatever pool you want to use. Basically, all of the pools are supported. There might be one or another pool that might not work, but you'll figure that out. If you want to play around with it, feel free. You can do whatever you want with this device. Nothing is restricted here. If you come over to the customization page, here you can change a little bit of the color scheme that you do have on your device. You can go for a light mode or for a dark mode, and you can also change the color scheme from the buttons and the highlighted scenes on the burger menu bar. If you go over to the settings page, you'll get plenty of settings that you can set. One of the important settings here is the frequency and the core voltage, as well as the automatic fan control that you could enable or disable. If you enable the fan control, you get a different slider. Now this slider tells you what is the target temperature that you want to achieve. Let's go for 55 degrees. That's a stable temperature that we can actually achieve. The display section is also really an interesting one. What you're currently using is the SSD 1306 display. But as I said, there are different displays that you could purge afterwards, or some of these resellers do offer you a BIDX with a different screen, like the big one in the corner here. If you click on it, it will give you a drop down menu and you can select what kind of screen you do have and you wanna use as well as there's a slider for how long you want this to be active or not. So I could slide this down to be only active for five minutes. And now if the device is up and running for more than five minutes, it will automatically shut down the display, which comes in handy. We also do have a flip screen and a invert screen functionality here. You do see there are the, these little eye icons right next to these info icons. If you do hover over them and you will see some of them over crowded over the whole UI, you get more information about it. The flip screen will rotate the LCD screen by 180 degrees and the invert screen will actually invert the colors, which is also a nice thing to have. It does not work with all the screens, but with some. If you come down to statistics, this will actually give you the option to save statistics about your device. So let's say I want to store up to 180 data points and I want to do this by an amount of 24 hours. What this will do, it will over the period of 24 hours store up to 180 data points. And if I now click on save, now this is activated what you will be able to see is if you go over to your device and onto the dashboard now because i just activated it it's not working but it will show you the previous data and the previous hash rate i can show you an example of that if you go over to the swarm page and i now hop over to another bit x this one right here it should give me the overview of the hash rate of the last 24 hours you see, this feature was previously not in the firmware and therefore I think it's really important to mention it here. Let's go back to the settings page. Below the statistics settings that we do have, you have the save and restart button. Depending on what kind of settings you changed, it will actually tell you if you only need to save or if you also need to restart the device. Another important feature is you want to come in occasionally on the dashboard and check for new releases. You can click on this check box here and what it will do, it will automatically take a look on GitHub. So it will connect to the GitHub server and tell you if there is a new release available on GitHub for you or not. If there is a new release available, you can simply just click on esp-miner.bin and www.bin download both of these files and then you can upload them here. We do have a update website and a update firmware section. In the update website, which you should do first, you would need to upload the www.bin file. After this is done, wait a couple of seconds, it will automatically refresh the web page. And afterwards, you can go ahead and you can actually flash the espminer.bin file to update the firmware. 
this will restart your device, so don't get confused by that. Another cool feature that is in the settings page, which is a little bit hidden, is if you do go into the URL section and we type in question mark OC, we now do get a different mode. Now we are in a custom settings mode, which you can use to overclock or play around with your device. It is not suggested to overclock your device. If you don't know what you're doing, you might damage or break your device. So do your own due diligence and do it with a little bit of caution. Don't throw 700, 700 megahertz on the frequency and three volts on the core. That won't work. It will break the device. Do it in small steps if you want to do so. But before you do that, you can always just disable the over clock mode again and you can play around with the settings that are in this drop down menu here for the frequency as well as for the core voltage. You also do see there are defaults. These are the defaults that are set by most of the manufacturers. Some of them will set them to a different value but these default values are tested well enough by us developers to give them out as the default value. Now the next section that we do have is the logs section. If you click over here, we do get plenty of information. The first one is the model. This is the model of the ASIC chip. Obviously, the next one is the uptime of the device, as well as a status if your Wi-Fi is connected or not. If your Wi-Fi wouldn't be connected, then it would, wouldn't tell you that it would be connected. Below that is the Wi-Fi RSSI. This is a nice feature. It does tell you how good the connection to your router actually is. And you do see it is fair in my example because I'm hovering over it. If I do go away with my mouse cursor, it wouldn't tell me that. But I also do have other examples that are not really that good. If you now go over to the Swamp page and I use another device, let's just use this one here, and I go over to the Logs page, you do see I have a really weak connection because this is sitting outdoors in my in my barn and is just using poor Wi-Fi connection, whatever is available over there. The next one is the MAC address that we do have, which is basically the address of the ESP chip that is on the device, as well as the free heap memory, which is basically just telling you how much space is left on the device to actually do computational work. It has nothing to do with the ASIC chip. This is purely the ESP, the microcontroller, this silvery little thing here on the BIDX. This right there, that is an ESP32. This connects over Wi-Fi to your network and it does control everything that is on this board. Below that, you will see what kind of version you're currently running. So in this example, I'm running the newest firmware, the version 2.8.1. As well, it is also showing you with what compiler this firmware was built. We are currently using the version 5.4.1 and this will only increment. If you do see something like a dash 30 version or something different, you do know whoever sold you the device did something different and something has changed on the firmware. It is not said that this is a bad thing, it's just been said that it might be that on the version or the ESP IDF version, there might be this dirty tag, which will show you that on the firmware stuff has been changed and that's not in the official repository. As well as on the very bottom, we do see there's the board version. Currently, I'm running the board 601, but there's already the board 602 out there. One of the coolest features, probably for all your nerds out there, is the real-time logs. If you click on that, we can actually see the logs, what the device is doing. You see the bare terminal of the device, what is going on. We see there's some power management stuff going on. We see the ASIC chip, the BM1370 module has been used. It is calculating some nonsense. It is sending over some information. We also see a little bit of information about the current output of the fan. And one cool thing is if you wanna look at it consistently and just stare at it, you can do that. You can maximize the logs to the entire screen. What you need to do is you need to come up here and you need to click on this icon. This should probably be sticky and will be changed soon. The last thing that you do have on your BIDX that you get with every single BIDX that you do have is the white paper. If you click on it, feel free to read it. I really do recommend it. That's it basically for your BIDX setup guide. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Keep hashing.